If you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the book of Galatians, chapter 6. I'm so excited for our sermon series this month as well. Uh, actually, it, it spans into June. Uh, so May and June, the best sermon ever. Amen. You want to be here Wednesday for the best sermon ever. We are getting into the Sermon on the Mount uh, and Jesus' message, amen, to, to his church. And so be here this Wednesday. You do not want to miss out. Galatians chapter 6, starting in verse 7, the Bible reads like this, and it says, The person who plants selfishness, ignoring the needs of others, ignoring God, harvest a crop of weeds. How many of you don't like weeds in your yard? How many of you work on removing weeds in your yard? I'm sure you do. With all this, with all this rain that we had, you know, you see, you see a lot of nice green front yards. But let me tell you right now, a lot of that green really isn't grass. A lot of it's weeds. Can you say amen? <laughs> Some of you are looking at your lawn and thinking, oh, man, my lawn looks beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful weeds <laughs> that have come up because of the rain. But we know what, what weeds do. They choke out the good grass, don't they? And this is what they do in, in our lives, in our spiritual lives. Those weeds choke out the good. So we want to get rid of weeds. Amen? How many of you want to get rid of weeds? All right, good, good. He says the person who plants selfishness harvests a crop of weeds. All he'll have to show for his life is weeds, the Bible says. But the one who plants in response to God, letting God's Spirit do the growth work in him, harvest a crop of real life. Eternal life, Paul says. This is what you and I, church, this is what you and I, God seeks to harvest in or through our lives. It's real life. How many of you want real living in your life? Amen? Yes, you want real living? You want to live on purpose? Amen? You want to see a, a, a great harvest in your life? God wants to see that as well. And he's going to do that. I titled this message this morning, It's All About You. Turn to your neighbor and tell him he's not talking about you. <laughs> it's all about you. The caption I put on the title is self-centered versus Christ-centered. Living a life, living a Christ-centered life. God wants us to live a Christ-centered life. It's all about you. Make sure that we understand when I say it's all about you, that it's not the person that you see in the mirror. When you think it's all about you, good looking, <laughs> it's all about you. Today we're going to do this and we're going to do that. It's all about you today. We're going we're gonna to pamper you. We're going to make sure that you have a great day. We're going to make sure you're looking good. How many of you made sure you looked good before you came to church? I know you did because I look out and I see a bunch of, bunch of good looking people this morning. You didn't show up in your pajamas to church. You didn't show up in your chanclas, right? <laughs> you wore some shoes. Maybe some of you are wearing chanclas this morning. <laughs> Man. <laughs> Hopefully you clean them feet. <laughs> but you wanted to look good this morning. You said, I'm going to take care of you. We're going to do you good today. But God says, it's not about you. It's about me. When we say it's all about you, we need to be looking to Christ and say, Christ, it's all, Jesus, it's all about you. It's always been about you. See, the question I asked this morning is, who or what do you and I live for? Sometimes we can center our lives around careers. Ooh. You know, it sounds good, right? Doesn't it? It sounds good. But it doesn't have a good ending, 
sometimes. Sometimes we center our lives around sports. We center our lives around hobbies. We center our lives around making money. Sometimes we just center our lives around making, uh, uh, having fun. I just want to have fun in life. And that's what I'm going to center my life around. See, these, there's nothing wrong with any of these things, but I'll tell you one thing, is that all these things make for a lousy center. It's not bad to have career goals. It's not bad to make money. It's not bad to have fun. It's not bad to, to, to you know, play sports and these kind of things or focus on these kind of things. It's not bad. But they make for a lousy center in life. And God says, you need to make sure that you have a good center. Turn to your neighbor and ask him, what is your center made of? <laughs> Don't touch their belly either. <laughs> You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna make some enemies this morning. <laughs> he, got a, he got a soft center, Pastor. <laughs> See, Paul writes in Galatians 6 that if a life lived for self only harvests weeds. Remember that? But when you live centered around God, you have a crop, the Bible says, of Real, say that with me, real life. Real life. Now you're truly living. Now you're truly living as God has called you to live. The Bible speaks of John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3. We all know of John, right? This guy was the one who dressed in clothes made of camel hair. That doesn't even sound comfortable. You found John chewing on wild locusts and honey. <laughs> but he lived a life centered around Christ. Some of you may think, well, wouldn't an individual that's dressed in clothes made of camel hair and he eats locusts, wouldn't he be drawing attention to himself? Let me show you what the Bible says. John chapter 1 and verse 8, the Bible says that John was not the light, the Bible says, but he came to testify about the light. You see, John centered his life around preparing the way for Jesus Christ. He lived a life that centered around, he knew, he knew what his, what his, what his in, or purpose was in life. And that was to make way for the king of kings. To make sure that everyone knows Jesus is coming. And I'm not trying to draw attention to myself. But I'm drawing attention to the king. I want everyone to know that the king is coming. He's coming, and you need to be ready. Don't focus on what I'm wearing. Don't focus on what, I'm e on, on what I choose to eat. But I need you to focus on who is coming. Matthew 11, verse 7, says this. It says, when John's disciples had gone, Jesus began talking about him to the crowds. When and, and Jesus said these words. He says, when you went out into the barren wilderness to see John, what did you expect him to be like? Were you expecting to see a man dressed as a prince in a palace? Jesus says, were you expecting to see a man dressed as a prince in a palace? What was Jesus saying? Well, that John wasn't living a life to draw attention to himself. Because if he really did, if he really wanted the attention, he would have dressed nice. Look at me. I'm like a prince in a palace. 
I must be someone special. That's, that wasn't what John purposed to do. Look at what John speaks in Matthew 3, verse 11. John says this, he says, I baptize those who repent of their sins. He says, but someone else is coming. He says, far greater than I am. He says, so great, John says, that I am not even worthy to carry his shoes. Does that sound like someone who seeks to draw attention to self? John says, I'm not even worthy to carry his shoes. He said, but I know my purpose. I know what God has called me to do. I know it's not all about me, but it's all about him. It's all about him. You know, it reminds me of what David writes in Psalm 96, verse 8. And he says, give to the Lord the glory that he deserves. Give to the Lord the glory that he deserves. How many believe that God deserves the glory? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. He always deserves the glory. Whether or not you think that, li that your life is going as you planned, God still deserves the glory. Whether or not you think that you can do things a little different or even better, God deserves the glory. Revelation 4.11, John writes, he says, You are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. He says, For you created all things. He says, And they exist because, they exist because you created all what you pleased. He says, Lord, you deserve the glory. You deserve the glory for you created everything. Everything we see, you created, Lord. The words that I speak from my mouth to let you know that you deserve the glory is from you. You have given me the ability to even give you the glory. The breath, of, the breath of my lungs is from you. And he says, and you created what you pleased. We know that creation pleased God, didn't it? The Bible says so. The Bible says that creation pleased God. And the Bible says that when he created man and woman, that he was very pleased. He's pleased with you, his creation. There may be some things in our lives that, that can be worked on, yes, but that's all of us. That's each and every one of us. We could all, we could all uh, uh, work on things in our lives. Not one of us is perfect. But God says, I am blessed by you. I am pleased by you. You're my creation. I remember Chaplain George, Chaplain George Garcia. And, um, I remember all the pictures that you would see of Chaplain George. He would be, he'd be doing this. He'd be doing this. And if you, didn't, if you, didn't, if, if you never knew him, you know, you would, you, you would think, wow, you know, he's very confident in himself. He thinks he's number one. He's always doing this. He must think very highly of himself if you never knew him. But when asked why he did this, he said that he was pointing to Christ. I'm pointing to Christ. Why? Because if I'm anything, it's because of him. If I can do anything to encourage someone, to help someone in their life, it's because of him. 
Are you kidding me? The life that I was living before Christ, I was helping no one. I wasn't even helping myself. I was hurting people. I was hurting myself. I had no future. But he understood that it was only because of Christ that he was able to do what God set him out to do. See, we need to point others to Christ. Point others to Christ. How do we do that? Paul writes in Colossians chapter 4 and verse 5, he says this, he says to walk in wisdom. Say that, walk in wisdom. All right, you're telling yourself that. Remember. What is Paul referring to? Paul's referring to our daily choices and behavior. God help us to walk in wisdom. To be that godly example to our children. To be that godly example to our grandchildren. To our unsaved loved ones. To our co-workers. Lord, help us to walk in wisdom. Church, we need to walk in wisdom. We need it. It's a must. God is calling us to be a godly example. He says, you are going to be a reflection of me. You will be the only Christ that many people will see in life. What are you going to be showing them? How are you going to display Christ through your life? And let me tell you right now, we need God's help, don't we? We need God's help. You can't do that on your own. You can't walk in wisdom by yourself. That's walking in foolishness. But to walk in wisdom is to not only walk in Christ, but to walk with Christ. See, you are not alone. You have to understand this. When you walk in wisdom, you're walking with someone. When you walk in wisdom, amen, you are walking with someone just like in here in church. You are not alone. The, the, the enemy might try to, try to lie to you to say that you are alone, that you're the only one going through what you're going through, but you have no idea what the person sitting in front of you, behind you, to the right or to the left, is going through as well or has gone through in their life. You are not alone. You look around and you have a great army of brothers and sisters in Christ that are praying for you, that are there for you. If you need some help, they're there to help you up. If you, if you, if you trip, they're not there to laugh at you. They're there to give you a hand and help you back up. That's what brothers and sisters in Christ do, don't they? You need to walk in wisdom, Paul says. This is how we can point others to Christ. You live a life that shows that you honor God. We don't just say it. You know, you know it's, it's nice to say the words. I follow Christ, and I'm a Christian. I go to church, and I read my Bible, and you know, I pray. I do. I really pray. But does your life show it? Do your actions show it, your behavior? God help us, all of us. Paul also talks about in, this, in that same verse, Colossians 4, chapter 5, and he says, redeeming the time. This is also how we can point others to Christ, is to redeem the time. What was Paul saying? Paul was saying that we must make our moments here on earth count not just for here, but for eternity. Make your moments that you have here on earth, the time that God has given you and I, make it count for eternity. You see, God is going to give his children opportunities to tell others about him. He does this in our lives. As we walk in wisdom, Others are going to ask us about our lives, aren't they? You've had it in your life. When others come up to you and say, hey, there's something different about you. 
Or, you know, hey, um, I want to I talk to you about this or that. Why do they want to talk to you? Because you have an inviting face? <laughs> I don't, maybe it is. But I would say that it's the life that you live. People come to you because they see a difference in your life. God brings people to you to, for them to share with you things that are taking place in their life. Why? Because they feel that they can trust you. And why can they trust you? Because you're just great a, you know, that great a person? Because you smiled at them? No, because there's something different about you. You see, and God gives us opportunities like that. He gives his, children's, uh, his children opportunities to tell others about him. This is what he does. Those are opportunities. The next time someone comes to you and says, hey, I need to share something with you. Something's been bothering me. You see it, oh, thank you, Jesus. This is an opportunity to tell them about you. That's what it is. And maybe there's some times, maybe there's been some times in your life when you didn't seize the opportunity. Someone came to you and they, they had these things that they're going through and you didn't, you didn't tell them about Jesus and what he can do in their life. Don't get discouraged. Don't, don't kick yourself for not doing that. God's gonna give you more opportunities. He's gonna give you more opportunities to do that. And, and when that opportunity arises, you seize the opportunity. You do it. You do what God is calling you to do. Don't think about your, your failures in the past, amen? Look at what God is going to do in the future in your life. And you make the most of those opportunities. You redeem the time. See, as you and I walk in wisdom and redeem the time that God has given to you and I, we can point others to Christ. We can do exactly as Chaplain George was doing. In every aspect of our lives, we're always doing this. Not just, not just with, a, with a finger motion, but in how you live as well. He lived a life that honored God. I know he did. I saw it. It was evident. Church, God wants that for each and every one of us. To walk in wisdom and to redeem the time that he has given to you and I. John chapter 1 and verse 10. It says this, it says, He came into the very world he created. It's talking about Jesus. He came into the very world he created. It's talking about God creating the world and Jesus coming in. But the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Mm. Wow. To everyone who believed and accepted him, he gave the right to be called children of God. In John chapter 8 and verse 50, Jesus says these words, and he says, I have no wish to glorify myself. What did he mean by that? So no, he does, he does not seek worldly glory. And no, he does not seek a private glory apart, apart from the Father's glory. But yes, he does seek his glory after his redemptive work is done. And this is the love that he pursued because this is the glory he invites us to enjoy forever. This is what Jesus invites you and I into. John chapter 17, verse 4 says, I glorified you, Father, on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. This is Jesus speaking. And now, Father, 
glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. See, even Jesus always pointed to the Father. He always pointed to the Father in everything that he did. See, we're looking this morning at a self-centered versus Christ-centered life. Mark chapter 9 and verse 35. The Bible says this, and it says, Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be the first must be the very last, and the servant of all. You see, today, our culture, we live with a me-first mentality, don't we? Me first, I'm going to be first in line. (laughs) We push and we shove to get first in line, don't we? I want to be the first to get this, and I want to be the first to get that. I want first place. I want to rise to the top. And that result, that mentality, is a self, it produces a self centered society. And you look out and you see a society that is very much that. Self-centered. All about self. What can I do for me? How can I make me happy? There are certain times of the year that, you know, we think of others and go the extra mile to serve them. You know, there's Thanksgiving. (laughs) There's Christmas. Christmas when we think of others before ourselves. But overall, I would say we take take care of ourselves first. Human beings are selfish creatures. And the thought of voluntarily being last and serving others isn't quite appealing to us. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, really, really get our attention. You know, who wants to be last? Oh, me, of course. (laughs) Who wants to put yourself aside and serve others? Oh, here I am right here. Who wants to put aside all the things that you have to do and do for someone else? I'm first. We don't tend to think that way in life. I read this quote. It says that the trouble with some self-made men is that they worship their creator. (laughs) You'll get that. You see, God's way is not the way of the world. His way is very different. Jesus says that if we want to be first in his kingdom, then we must put ourselves last. And not only that, but we must serve God others. Take on a servant's heart. Philippians 2 verse 4, Paul says these words and he says, look out for one another's interest, not just for your own. You can see Paul dealing with the same issues that we deal with 2,000 years later. The very same things that Paul was dealing with, with the church of Philippi, is the same thing that the church in Norwalk deals with. Don't we? Come on, we're in church. You can say amen to that. (laughs) You and I can agree that we make a lot of selfish decisions in our lives. We do this. We call it survival. <laughs> I have to survive, so I gotta, I gotta think about myself, right, Pastor? <laughs> I understand that. See, but the thing is, is when we are so focused on self that you don't see everyone else around you 
and you don't see how you can meet their needs. You don't see that God didn't put you here to meet your own needs, but that he put you here to be a servant. So I don't mean don't take care of yourself. <laughs> I don't mean, you know, don't comb your hair. What? Pastor, I didn't have time for myself because I was serving others. So I came to church a mess. <laughs> I didn't take a shower because I had no time. I was serving others. (laughs) Let's not go extreme with this. You got time to do those things. You can't fool me. I know no one's going to do that, but some take it to the extreme. We still have time to take care of ourselves. We know we do. But let us never, ever forget that God has called us to serve one another. See, self-centeredness destroys relationships. And if you don't believe me, I want to ask you this question. How did your relationship, let's talk to married couples, but this could apply to anyone that has a relationship with anyone, friendship, uh, a, a marriage, you know, there's all kinds of relationships. How did that relationship begin? I'll tell you. I know the answer. There was a lot of selfless acts. Think about it. Think about how your relationship with so-and-so began. There was a lot of uh, selfless acts. There was doing for others. I remember when I when I met my wife. You know, there was it was it was always you know you know. Uh, what, what I can do, and I'm not trying to get to a point where everything has changed, because <laughs> but I'll tell you right now, and I'm sure we are all guilty of this, is that some things have changed in our lives. Where we were all about someone else, where we were all about serving, when it was all about him or her, some things changed down the road. As years passed, you may have gotten that mentality of, oh, they're already, they're already a part of my life, so I don't need to pay that much attention. So I don't need to do that much as I did before when I was trying to get them. <laughs> they're mine now. They can't go anywhere. <laughs> they're stuck. You see that ring? That ring means that, that, that they are my possession. <laughs> And I don't need to do anything like I did before in order to keep this relationship. And God help us. God help us, because that's when everything goes wrong. That's when you lose those relationships. Why? Because the same thing that was required to build the relationship is the exact same thing that is required to keep it. Wives, you should be clapping right now as hard as you possibly can. (laughs) Those hands should be bleeding. (laughs) So you see how self-centeredness can destroy a relationship. Because selflessness builds it. So the other does the opposite. Look at what James writes in James chapter 4 and verse 1. He says, where do you think all these appalling wars and quarrels come from? (laughs) He says, do you think they just happen? He says, think again. They come about because you want your own way. Wow. Some of you need to underline that in your Bible. James 4 verse 1. Some of you are wondering why you argue so much with your spouse. Why do we have so many arguments? It seems like we're always fighting. You know why? Because you both want your own way. You know why? Because there's little to no selfless acts taking place in that relationship. You start living selflessly, both, 
And when, and when you're doing it and the other is not, don't get all upset and quit. You keep doing that. You keep living the way God has called you to live. Don't let them dictate what you do in life and how you treat others. Treat others as, as Christ has treated you. Isn't that what the Bible says? Isn't it? God, didn't, God doesn't give up on you. How many times have we failed him and he still hasn't given up on us? Who are we to say that we can give up on this and that like if we have the right to? God is calling us to do our part. Yes, there's things that take place that I don't even want to get into that the Bible talks about that, 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 that you know, are destructive relationships. But for the most part, God wants us to do, to be selfless. He wants us to not focus on self. I read this quote. It says, God sends, God sends no one away empty except those who are full of themselves. <laughs> this is very true. Remember what Paul said in our text in Galatians chapter 6. He said, when we, when we ignore others, we are ignoring God. John chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, therefore, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. <laughs> Did you guys catch that? Lazarus was ill. Lazarus was ill and Jesus was so concerned about Lazarus being ill that he stayed where he was for two more days. I'm sure some of you caught that. So concerned, you would think he would just leave right away, wouldn't you? It was whom he loved, Lazarus, a great friend. And he stood for two more days where he was. I'm sure many of us would think that same thing. Why? Why didn't you come quickly? The Bible says that when Jesus finally came, Lazarus was dead. Mary and Martha were crying in tears. I want you to notice something here. But what I just mentioned, that Jesus chose to let Lazarus die. He was in no hurry. Why? Because his intention was not to spare the family grief, but his intention was to raise Lazarus from the dead. See, because what, what would you say is greater? Someone who's alive and sick and is healed or someone who's sick and died and then comes back to life? Which one is greater? Which one do you think would amaze you more? Which one of those miracles would you think, wow, that is God? You know, I, I would tend to think the latter, correct? You know, I would think, oh, you know, I've seen sick people healed before. I've seen them get better. You know, it could be a number of things. This is what we humans do. It could be a number of things. You know, was he or she eating better? There you go. Were they taking medicine? Psh, there you go. Were they exercising? Yeah, there you go. Were they getting enough sleep? See, it could have been this. 
It could have been all of these things. And this is what we as humans do. We, t- we try to bring logic into what's taking place in front of us. Human logic. But let me tell you right now, when Lazarus died, nobody thought that he was going to come back to life. No one thought that. I guarantee it. Mary and Martha, I guarantee you, weren't thinking, oh, you know what? There's still a chance. <laughs> when they saw lights out in his life. <laughs> I still believe. No. I think all hope was gone. It was wiped out. Any thought of him him recovering was gone out the window. Jesus knew that the power of God can do anything. And so he says, look, I allowed this to happen because I want God to get the glory. I want God to get the glory. You need to understand that you as humans, if if I just heal a sick person, you're just going to give praise to something else. (laughs) You're going to go, you're going to go make a, you know, make a, 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 a golden calf and worship that. You people are crazy. But if I bring them back from the dead, no one's seen something like that before you're going to know that it was supernatural. You're going to know that it was the Father. Revelation chapter 5, as the worship team comes forward this morning. Revelation chapter 5. Verse 11 says this. It says, And I beheld, and I heard a voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. And thousands upon thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, John says, blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits on the throne, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Church, God has not called you to live a self-centered life. Why? Because all self-centeredness produces is death. And I need you to hear me on this. It produces death. Not only does it produce death in relationships, but it produces death in our life for eternity. That mentality of self is killing us. It's killing our society. Me, me, me. It's what I need. It's what I want. It's what I deserve. God, help us to not take on this entitlement attitude. Help us, Lord. Help us. The only thing 
us sinners are entitled to is life apart from God. That's all you and I are entitled to for the things that we've done. We don't deserve his grace. You and I don't deserve his mercy. You don't. I don't. God wants us to be Christ-centered. Christ-centered, Lord, it's all about you. Everything points back to God. Everything. And we need to know this and we need to live like it. Matthew 11, 11, I'll close here. Matthew 11, 11, this is Jesus speaking. He says, truly, of all men ever born, none shines more brightly than John the Baptist. Wow. That's, that's something else. You mean the guy that wore funky clothes? and ate gross things, we all thought he was mental. <laughs> we all thought he lost it. He wasn't firing on all cylinders. John? That guy? Jesus says yes. That man. Out of everyone born, none have shone brighter. Why? Ask yourself this question, church. Why? Why did he shine brighter than everyone that was, that was ever born? Because he lived a life that pointed to Jesus. This is why you have to put two and two together. You want your life to shine? Not for yourself, but to put focus on Jesus, then you live for him. You live for him. You center your life around him. You give all glory to him. Church, as Jesus spoke of John, he speaks of you. As every head is bowed, every eye closed. Thank you, Jesus.